Uh, so if anyone is brave enough to scan the QR code on a lecture that's about malware, congrats. So this is just a link to the repo in the slides. Um, there's a lot of small text, so uh, might be good to look at even later. Uh, there's also some extra examples in the slides as well. So today we'll be talking about writing nameless NIM, which is using NIM as a language to write offensive tools um, by stripping away the NIM runtime. Uh, so first, who am I? Uh, I do VR and HackerMan and it's Freebie Dynamics out of uh, DC metro area. I'm a member of the US Cyber Games. So I'm a season one athlete. I'm a couple of years as a tech mentor, average CTF, now dev, and cat enjoyer, as we'll see. So what is an NIM runtime? NIM is defined as an efficient, expressive, and elegant language by its creators. It compiles down to C, C++, JavaScript, and a few other languages. Um, but essentially, it has very readable syntax like Python and pretty straightforward to understand. It's also got a really cool type system since it's static and type. And it also has uh, what's called macros and templates. Those are really useful and fun to mess with and mount that. The NIM runtime includes safety checks, memory allocation, and garbage collection. So we don't have any index, um, index out of bounds and buffers. Um, you don't have any in underflows or overflows. That's strictly on the runtime. So if we have memory safety and in checks, why would we want to remove it? Um, so a lot of new teams and stuff have flagged the NIM runtime. Um, it's very easy to notice when the NIM binary is the NIM binary. If we remove the runtime, we can also get a NIM program that's kilobytes in size, anywhere around three to six, sometimes more, depending on how you compile it. This is good for stage zero payloads and loaders. Um, you can also leverage this for a position independent shell code and as an added benefit is for Maldiv. So a basic program in NIM would look like this. Um, this is just like a really simple printf, um, prints out hello b-size 420, um, command line, and we're compiling this with drelease, um, which this is adding on the ORC memory manager, it's having optimized for speed, and it's, um, it's not having as many debug symbols. What it looks like when we disassemble this is the C runtime is going to call pre-main and mid-main module. You'll also see pre-main inner called in between those, depending on how it's compiled and what libraries you're using. Inside pre-main, um, this is setting up the runtime. The one of the most interesting one is this last one. Um, if we follow the call and look into it. We see it call a lot of these nim load libraries and then git proc adder. These are just wrappers for load library A and git proc address. So what this results into is the int, the um, import address table, always having a git proc adder, oh, git proc address, and a git module handle A. Um, a lot of malware, if it's um, dynamic link, we'll, we'll see this and it's kind of a, a flag that something suspicious is going on. Going back and looking at this, we see the call into the main module and where it is calling our main function. Um, and on the right, it looks very ugly. This is with all the runtime. We're having overflow checks. We're having um, kind of a pseudo pointer table, table these allocations. Dialects, assertion, kind of just a whole bunch of stuff. A little nasty to rev. So let's look at this as we are to write a program without this rev time. Um, so in this sort of quick coding style, as it, it becomes a little bit more C-like. We're managing memory by ourselves. Um, we have to manage threads by ourselves. We don't have a runtime to do that for us. And we also have a limit of types. Um, NIM has various types that get allocated in the heap, uh, such as reference objects. So all of our objects have to be in the stack. Uh, we use out on a lot of function with the string class or uh, string module, um, where we, since that gets dynamically allocated in the heap, we can't add or remove. So we have to manage all that ourselves. Um, yeah. Might be a limitation, but it's a drastically different way of writing them. Uh, just some information of what I've had added to this is I'm using the NIM compiler 2.0.2, and then also GCC. 11.1.0. This GCC is a stock when it comes in Britain when you install it, but we can swap it out with different GCCs. So we're going to use a NIM config that's uh, slightly modified from a Bitmancer repo. 
Um, this is used to facilitate the stripping away of the VM runtime as well as the C runtime. Um, so we look at it. The first thing we do is we're going to import WinIM. WinIM is a module of a NIM that is used to um, interface with the Windows API. So we're going to use this for heavy lifting of typing and then also dynamically linking for um, for a process, for process imported. Next, we have a pseudo printf, we call a template for A. It takes var args as an argument, so that way you can do a ws printf A um, into a buffer, and then you can call write console with the uh, standard output handle and write that buffer to the output, and then local free the allocation that we have done with that buffer. Um, and then in main, we have the, the pseudo printf that we have just created, and it prints out besides 420. In the config, what we've done is we have passed into the NIM compiler, and then that passes it into the linker to let us know that we are dynamically linking kernel 32 and user 32. Um, and this assembly, this starts looking really basic. Um, our start call just calls main, doesn't do anything else. When I say call main, it just jumps to main. And then our main function just looks like as if the template has been implanted, it's just straight into the code, it's not called. That's how mid template works. I like to think of it as the defined macro in C. But we can look at this call local alloc, and we can see that it's referencing the uh, a jump keyword to where local alloc is in the IAT. And then we can see that with all the others. Uh, another thing I'd like to point out is this, this reference to a NIM stream. And I mentioned we have a lot of limited functionalities with NIM streams. We do get NIM streams with this but they get added into the read-only data section. So um, that can be an IOC on this type of binary. And at the end, it just writes. And it's going to write into a program that has just read into a start function that has only called jump main. So we're not going to exit cleanly. Uh, we wait to exit and just be called uh, exit process. So what do we get from this? We get an INT that looks much more script we see if only our functions that hold in a couple of the, the C runtime that have been included, uh, such as intercritical section. And then we see our one call from user 32, which is the dead rest printf. And this has compiled into a binary of three kilobytes in size if we strip it. The um, sample program we can look at next is a self deleting program. Uh, so this uses code that was published by um, Jonas Light in Void Labs, um, pretty much the same deleting. Uh, self deleting program in C. Um, we're going to write it in such a way that we don't use the IET at all. So, in order for us to do this, we're going to have to write a custom uh, Git module handle and Git proc address. So, over here we have kind of some generic templates that we're going to use to start to help facilitate. We have a utils folder. This is going to contain kind of all of our utilities that we'll use in this. Uh, Dimless runtime. We have a GMH, which is Git module handling replacement. Go to, uh, this is go to functionality. We don't, do not have that again. Uh, GPA is the Git proc address replacement. And we have a hash, which is going to be hashing functions. So our custom replacements are going to hash, uh, are going to find the functions by hashes. And uh, it's written in such a way that you can arbitrarily put any hashing format or algorithm that you want to put in there. Um, then we have Stackster. This is going to do stack string allocations, so we can have strings that avoid writing to read only data. And we're going to have the SDIO, which is going to be kind of just strictly used for debug use, um, so we can see our output and see what we're doing in the core of our program, being in self delete. Uh, in module handle, this is an implementation in DM. Not only going to go too deep into it, but we can read from the pad. Um, Get a, and then from there, get weather data and I parse over the list entry table and then compare if the hash that we're passing in is the same as the hash string that is from the list entry table. If it is there, we return that address. If it's not, we're going to cast null. So the, um, the, the mouth that is going to have to handle all of the um, allocations of this to make sure that it's returning a valid address. So I have a little ugly. Um, how, how do we use this? So, the, the first way of using it is by declaring a variable of h kernel 32, calling our custom git module handle a hash. We pass in a string that we, we um, typecast as a C string, 
and then we step it and hash that. So this is going to happen with compile time. So that kernel 32 stream is not going to be introduced in the binary at all. If we allocate it in the global scope, then um, this data is going to be, uh, H kernel 32 is going to be variable in the BSS. If we do it in the functional scope, then that's going to be allocated on the stack and another way of avoiding a data section. Uh, this, the echo pass kit was done um, testing it with the runtime, so we do not have access to echo uh, writing in West Ham. Here we have a template, GMH, that is just a wrapper for that. What it's going to do is we're going to pass in a, C, or a NIM stream, it's going to cast it through C stream, and call the static hash stir, and just kind of wrap it all for you. And now we have the custom git proc adder. This is just a pretty generic C implementation. Um, parts of DOS and NT header, um, and then the functions are in an ordinal array, um, so we can get that. And then the same way we're doing on the git module handler, handle is we're calling um, a hash stir on the function name that's from the table and finding the value. And again, this way is a little bit more ugly of using it. Uh, so in order for us to cast it as a correct function that we can call later on, we have to type, declare what the function is. And this is going to declare the type, and the arguments is passed into the function with the argument types, what it returns, and we need to define standard call. So it uses the, the Windows calling conventions. From there, we can declare a variable, h curl32, because get proc address needs a handle passing, this is the first one. Uh, then we call it park address with a handle, and then the string we're looking for, we do the same thing with static so we can get that allocation to the show up um, and avoid the data section usage, and then we can call directly on our function. A wrapper of this looks very simple and straightforward. GPA, we can pass in a handle, a div string, and the T. This T is a generic, so we can pass in anything in this. And what this is doing is casting to the type and if we declare the type, we can pass it in that. Or if the type is already declared in the WinM library, we can rely on WinM to do all the dynamic uh, typing for us. So that way we don't have to declare it. Cleans up code a little bit more. We can see we have quite a few lines on the top one, and on this bottom, we just have one. Now we can call key local out and call the local out function. So we're also going to clean up the start of our program. Instead of just jumping to main, uh, we are going to declare our own start function, and we're going to use inline assembly. Uh, the assembly, we're going to adjust the stack, make sure it's 16 by line, and then call main. We can see it, if we inline it, it goes directly, what we write directly into the binary. One of these fragments that I'm passing in to start is code decal with an attribute of declaring it in section. What this is going to do, um, like this, it's nothing else to be a declarer section in text. So it puts it at the top of the text section. And uh, we can see why it's done that. Here in the second, our main function is going to call delete self. And if it's true, return one, else zero, delete self is that implementation of it, deleting itself from the binary um, using git module handle and get proc address replacements. So when you do that and you run it, it pops up a console. Well, um, we can just pass in subsystem windows to the linker and then a console from the So now we have this self delete program. We can pass in the arc to strip it so there's no symbols. We're left with a binary three kilobytes of size, like our first example. Looking into the disassembly and uh, decompilation, we see that there's a data section that's not used. So we can just pass in a custom linker script to say we don't need the i data, um, we can just use the data. And it compiles to a program that's two kilobytes in size, um, but there is no data section. It's just the Windows header and then the text section. Now, since we've declared that start uh, function to be a dot, dot text, now it's at the beginning of the binary. So what we can do is we can strip out and uh, extract just the text section of the binary, and this leaves us with shell code. It's position independent. We're not linking any libraries. We're resolving all handles and functions within the code. So we've essentially just written this shell code. Um, a quick add to GPA. Um, while playing around with this stuff, eValloc didn't work. The reason why it didn't work is because eValloc was a for, uh, forwarded function in uh, kernel 32. So we can 
add into our um, GitHub address and, and handle um, forwarded functions. Um, since we've stripped away to C runtime, we don't have access to a lot of C utilities, such as stuff in stream header. Um, so we have to create our own Sterling A. You know, it's pretty easy to do, and we can throw in a function and call it. Uh, so we have shell code. What can we do now? We can write a self injecting loader using direct syscalls. So this is a startup function. Sometimes we have a stack screen that's going to be declared, such as in the self injecting loader, um, we need to download shell code from the URL. Uh, one simple implementation of kind of hiding that a little bit, not really, is just doing a a rolling sort key um, to encode it. And then we can decline, de declare this stack, source stack screen, which is going to take a generic i and j on uh, this, sorry, generic i and j. Um, these are just the, the arrays lengths of buff and key, so that way we can um, pass in any arbitrary known uh, string and string for the URL and key for the key, and kind of iterate over it. Well, we declared a pragma inline, so the name compiler is going to inline this if, if possible. If not, it's been called as a function. We've kind of left to uh, what the new compiler wants us to do. Um, we're trying to break it as much as possible, but at the end of the day, um, we're stuck with what we have without modifying the compiler itself. Uh, with that, we can just do some simple Python to do this for us and then call the function. Um, so this is almost uh, APT level encryption. Floss finds this, but we can use our imagination to do other things. So what we're going to use is we're going to use Hellscape to call direct syscalls. I'm not going to go too much into detail about Hellscape besides the implementation of the specific to NAM. Um, so get payload from URL A is a wrapper to just uh, download the payload and store it at a key allocation. Uh, local shellcode injection is going to use the Hellscape to do the direct syscalls. Um, the very first thing is we need to allocate a VX table. Um, this VX table is going to live on the stack, as I um, described earlier. This VX table contains VX table entries of the syscalls that we need to call. Um, those entries has an address, a hash, and a syscall word. That syscall word is the value we SSN that is being called uh, when we call a syscall instruction. Um, from there, we can... Uh, we can call those syscalls by calling the function hellscape with a syscall pass in. And this sets up a global section in the data to tell which um, which syscall we're at and which one we're being called next. And in health descent, we can pass in arguments and call that syscall. Um, as described, this is a call for the NTALIC virtual man. What it looks like within the stubs, these stubs are hellgate and health descent. Hellgate essentially just passes in the sys and sets it to that global syscall entry. We look at it in the function, and all it's doing is moving a byte into or a word into um, a pointer in the data, data section. Don't really need a function call for that. So we can just add inline to inline that in. Um, it's kind of an example of how we can optimize it as we're writing. And health descent is a, a cool way of doing this. Um, we give it a pragma of var r, so we can take in any number of arguments that we pass in. We also declare the first r to be auto. So that way, uh, we pass in one of any r and then var r's. So all of our arguments get passed in, and we don't have to redeclare a new function for every syscall that we're creating. And then it has a simple wrapper um, with how syscalls work. Use rcx into r10, then calls the syscall. So that looked easy. Uh, what was the catch with that? Well, if you compile it as is, what you can see is it just fails to execute. Um, and this is partially for a reason with how the um, compilation is happening. We're having a kind of like a an overflow of trying to compile um, the program into something that's in the 64-bit address space and it kind of exceeds that for whatever reason. But for weird reasons, I don't know why. We pass in zero to the image base and try to base the image at zero. Um, we get it to, to compile perfectly fine. And this leaves the program um, six kilobytes in size. Um, so we can do some obfuscation since this binary looks pretty simple and straightforward. We can then add in anti-debugging um, into our hellscape 
just adding a new syscall into these VX table entry, and then in house gate where they've defined as calling um, in its table, um, we just do the same thing with how we implement the other ones. We grab the hash and store it into that VX table entry, statically hashing a string at runtime, and then we call get VX table entry, which will populate that VX table. Um, and then we can add a call to our exec table, which will check for a debugger at runtime. Um, so what else can we do with awesome obfuscations? If we want to kappa on the binary, we can see what capabilities is on it. We see Zor encryption being used, um, head loader data being accessed, and parts of the head header. So first one we can tackle is obfuscation. Um, Alex Trudelet has a good article of string obfuscation. And just using a simple way, we can add um, a jump into our for loop of our source stack screen. And for whatever reason, this breaks Kappa's ability to find Zor, uh, Zor encryption being used. Um, we can adjust how we access the PEB uh, to trick static analysis into fake names and media access. Instead of reading directly from uh, keyboard corner GS60, we can adjust and move 10 into RAX and then times uh, hex 10 into RAX and then times 6. And then this allows us to reference that and it removes that capability from tab of finding it. Um, and the last one is the, we'll go back for a second, is parsing the PE header. This one is a little bit more tricky to do. What we do is we create a template that um, we'll check if a value passed in is zero, uh, and if it is, it's going to jump to a failure. Um, and then we just span this all into a function. It kind of messes up the control flow, flow graph, and um, we define AS and failure, so we inline the tag of where it would jump to, and then give our, our failed return result. Uh, issue with this is because of the way it's being compiled, is we can only call this template once per NIM file. So you can do it multiple times in other NIM files. Um, this is the example from GPA. I did the same with Hell's Gate since they are both parsing the PE. With Hell's Gate, I had a test jump fail one and something like a test jump fail two. So that way I can do more with two different labels. Um, same methodology was applied to Hell's Gate, it's just a little bit more gross. Um, kind of doing a little bit more than just a simple GPA. This brings us to a program that is uh, about five and a half kilobytes in size and no capabilities found by Kappa. Uh, trying with various optimization levels can get different results. Uh, for me, I was using size, uh, but no optimization, optimization one and optimization two affects the binary uh, differently. A uh, quick demo on this is we also have a reverse shell in the code. Um, go through this kind of quick. This is going to create a PowerShell reverse shell uh, that create a process and then call delete self. And that's going to be the shell code. Uh, of course, not very opposite, concern safe. And then we're going to use that new obfuscated loader as um, our shell code loader. This is going to be on a fresh install Windows 10 um, with the vendor enabled. We're going to update our stack strings. Now we have a new IP. And then we're going to parse out the shell code with Binja and compile the program. So this could be a demo. Um, we'll see. Uh, Defender is open. Uh, we'll grab the shell code from this terminal on the top left. That is just hosting uh, the payload and the shell code. So we'll grab your payload with Edge and then uh, verify that we actually want the program to trust it. Keep anyway. Down here on the bottom left, we all have a make listener open. We have the main binder in terms of executing it. It's going to pop up if we want to actually run this program since it's unsigned. We'll assume the user will say run anyway. And we get a shell connected back and the program is deleted itself. And like a good EPT will work into their mind. We can see that it's completely deleted. And to wrap this up, real quick, what else can we do? Uh, instead of compiling the C, we can compile with C instead. We have to add an exception to use go to since C has different exceptions than uh, an exceptionist language like C. 
If we're going to pass in different optimization levels that we want to do as a user, we have to declare opt to none because if we declare opt speed or opt size with min, it's automatically going to populate those with OS and O3. Um, OS being size, O3 being speed. Um, a lot of times I like to compile with a cache being out of it so I can see main JSON, see exactly what flags are being passed into the compiler and linker and what files are being compiled. And we can change our GCC to test out different implementations of what's being executed. For example, we can use 13.2.0, which contains the OZ optimization, and they can create a slightly smaller subcode. And to end it on, the best advice for this is to play with your compiler. Um, here on the left, we have OS, and it's pretty straightforward control flow graph. Here in the middle, we have using ABX, which is the advanced instruction set. And then on the far right, we have ABX. 512F, which looking at these control flows, they get more and more out of it. If I was going to CTF myself on the far right, I would go outside and touch grass. Um, so that brings us to the end of the talk. Do you have any questions on the end? I got a kind of unrelated question. So, like, do you have any NIM frameworks that are like dynamic compilation, kind of like how C Sharp has Roslyn and Go has Garble or anything? Um, yes, I mean, there's plenty. As far as dynamic, that's been written like NIM, I don't know where, like, I think so. Okay. Um, pretty much the way NIM works is if you have any compiler that can compile C code, yeah. you can use it with NIM. Um, because the NIM will compile into C. And then that C is used in the C compiler. Oh, gotcha. Okay, I misinterpreted how this works. Thank you. Yeah. With that, that's all I had.